All right. Uh, welcome, everybody. Thank you for coming. Uh, it's a pleasure to have the, today uh, with us uh, Dr. Saito from University of California at uh, Davis. Uh, Dr. Saito uh, did his uh, first degrees in uh, a bachelor's and uh, master's in mathematical engineering at the University of Tokyo. And uh, uh, in um, 84, he first joined uh, Schlumberger in, uh, in Japan and then transferred uh, to Schlumberger in Connecticut, Ridgefield, Connecticut. And uh, in 97, he also started his uh, uh, PhD uh, in applied mathematics uh, at uh, Yale University. And uh, I'm sorry, he finished in 94, not in 97. And, uh, um, in 97, he, he joined the University of California in Davis as a, a, an assistant professor, and he's currently a professor. He also served as chair of the graduate uh, group in applied mathematics at UC Davis. And uh, he uh, received several awards, among them uh, the best paper award for SPIE in the way of applications in signal image analysis. And uh, he got a presidential early career award, and, or the PKs, so the very prestigious PKs from NSF. And um, he also uh, uh, has led several uh, uh, working groups at SIEM. And uh, he was, in fact, uh, the chair of the SIEM uh, uh, in image uh, uh, activity group you know, on image sciences. And uh, he uh, he's currently on the uh, editorial board of uh, three journals, uh, Applied Computational uh, and Computational Harmonic Analysis, Inverse Problems and Imaging, and uh, the Journal of Mathematical Imaging and Physics. And it's a pleasure to have him in here today, uh, and he'll be talking uh, about Russian uh, and all its, uh, its uh, various uh, variations. And uh, it's a pleasure to have you here. Thank you. Well, OK. Thank you very much, Amit. Uh, thank you for the invitation. And it's a pleasure to, to visit uh, this beautiful campus today. And so today, I'm going to talk about uh, basically Laplacians and um, its basics and its applications, OK? and not too much details because this is the amount of work um, you know easily go beyond uh, you know one hour so therefore I will try to basically be uh, um, you know uh, brief but if you have any questions uh, please uh, you know uh, do not hesitate uh, to ask any questions during my talk okay so so I'm going to talk about two excursions around Laplacians. Okay, so here's the outline of my talk today. First, introduction. On the excursion one, I will take you to Laplacians on the complicated domains in RD. Okay, D may be two or three usually, right? Okay. Uh, some domains, uh, you may think, you may be able to think about some applications where you have some you know, weird shaped domain and then you have some measurement on that domain. Uh, instead of usual uh, you know, rectangular domain or square domain or uh, circular domains. So over there, Laplacians, or in particular Laplacian eigenfunction will be very help helpful. Um, then excursion two, I'm going to take you to uh, Laplacians on the graphs, okay, where you have also a lot of interesting things are happening. Uh, and then we conclude with some summary. Okay, So here's uh, acknowledgment first, because I tend to forget uh, uh, to show this acknowledgment uh, you know, in the end. So uh, this basically a uh, series of um, research was supported by ONR grants and NSF grants. And then here a list of some um, people who helped me, uh, either giving, uh, gave me uh, the data set or um, applied uh, my method to their own problems and then get, uh, gave me some feedback, like uh, Faisal Baird uh, uh, applied his, uh, you know, this method to um, um, hippocampus uh, images of the brain. 
uh, Leo Charupa gave me some uh, dendritic uh, trees uh, data set of neurons. Um, uh, Tim Delso is uh, uh, George Mason University environmental scientist applied Laplacians on uh, you know uh, global scale. Rotfi and John and um, uh, basically uh, I uh, ask various questions about Laplacians. Jeff um, and Ernest uh, Uoi are my former students, so was Aaron. Yuji Nakatsukasa is a very interesting guy in numerical analysis, and he's now at Oxford University. He was not my student, but I collaborated with him uh, while he was doing PhD at uh, UC Davis. Okay, and Queen Lam is uh, Sha is a faculty member at UC Davis, and who is an expert on ramified optimal transport, and I'm going to talk about it uh, also later in excursion two. All right, so. Here's uh, one thing I would like to mention. So, uh, Professor uh, Hajime Urakawa at Tohoku University, uh, I only met him once uh, in 2005, uh, but he said um, in some journal in 1999, says that the following. So, uh, a, long, a, a long time ago, when I was a college student, I was told, there is good mathematics around Laplacians. And I engaged in mathematical research and education for a long time. But after all, I was just walking around Laplacians, which appear in all sorts of places under different guises. When I reflect on the above proverb, however, I feel keenly that it represents an aspect of important truth. I was ignorant at that time, but it turned out that Laplacians are one of the key words in uh, to understand the vast field of modern mathematics. That's what he said. So then, uh, basically, I second Professor Rakawa's opinion, and I want to add there are uh, good applications also in engineering and science around Laplacians. That's what I'm going to talk about today. OK, so uh, excursion one. So this is Laplacians on a complicated domain. So here are uh, what we are uh, talking about. So we uh, consider, let's consider a bounded domain, or general shape domain, omega, in uh, Rd. D, maybe, as I said, two or three. And then we want to analyze some data okay, in this domain, uh, omega, uh, something like uh, spatial frequency information inside the object, uh, omega. And then we want to g avoid Gibbs phenomenon uh, due to the existence of this boundary. So if you have a data here, right, okay, and then outside you, ha you don't have a data, then uh, you have some, uh, you know, boundary here, right? So um, if you don't treat this boundary well, then you get something like a Gibbs phenomenon due to this discontinuity of the data at the boundary, as you can, uh, you know, often see. Uh, so uh, we want to represent this kind of object uh, efficiently for analysis and interpretation discrimination. And so in order to do that, we need to have fast decaying expansion coefficients or sparse coefficients, if you will, okay, uh, relative to also meaningful basis. We would like to uh, say whether these base vectors are doing something, represent some reality or represent certain uh, specific features so that you can interpret uh, whatever analysis you do, okay? Um, and then we will also want to extract and analyze geometric information about this shape. For example, the, uh, this is a, uh, one of the heroes, my heroes, Mark Katz. Uh, he posed a famous question, um, can, we, uh, can one hear the shape of a drum? Right? Okay. So uh, this, this question led to a uh, development of, for example, uh, spectral geometry and shape clustering and classification. Um, so here's uh, uh, some ideas I only uh, initially had. So let's say this is an image you want to analyze. It's a, you know, a cartoon shape. And we want to analyze, for example, uh, background texture of this image, like a, this dark region, with, without being bothered by the object itself, for example. Or we want to uh, uh, analyze 
this uh, face, skin portion, okay, maybe texture of the skin or whatever, right? Okay, wrinkles. And then uh, we want to also analyze those uh, specific parts of the object, like eyes and nose and mouth, individually, separately. So how can we do that? So in order to do that, we need to have some basis functions tailored to those regions, right? Okay. So that's uh, um, ori my original motivation of uh, developing these things. So for this, uh, this one is an interesting uh, data set. This is, uh, as you can see, this is a, a map of Japan. And it's basically the data set uh, I got is uh, the geologic information of uh, um, uh, island of Japan, islands of Japan uh, at each one kilometer square. Okay, so this consists of to huge number of points, and each point basically, you know, records some geological information, 14 different uh, attributes. So this kind of the, uh, so this color right now represents some geologic, you know, st uh, information about uh, uh, these islands. And then if, we, if I have this data set, right, so um, how can we analyze this kind of complicated domain? So this is a Phaserberg's data set. This is the um, 3D hippocampus shape analysis, and then this is a shape, right? Okay. So how can we basically analyze and cl uh, classify the shape of hippocampus uh, like this? Uh, depend, uh, you know, whether one has uh, you know a problem with Alzheimer's disease or not, and so forth. Okay. The, this is a data set. Um, Tim Delso uh, uh, used. So this is our Laplacian eigenfunctions, first three of them, uh, totally basically concentrated on the lungs. Um, so if you have some data set okay, distributed on those uh, land portion, like a temperature or you know, uh, population density or whatever, right? you want to basically dis decompose and the light those data set as a linear combination of these basis functions. So this is the uh, basis functions completely uh, concentrated on, Ira, uh, on the uh, ocean, right? Okay, first three of them, like that. So, so those are the motivations. Um, so, so what we want to do is this. So, um, so. To do this kind of analysis, it is useful to construct the so-called Laplacian eigenfunction on that specific domain. And what is Laplacian so, or, or uh, Laplace operator? So uh, in RD, this Laplace operator, usually it's a good idea to use negative minus okay, of Laplacian operator, okay, because then that makes actually a positive operator. Okay. And then this is just a second derivative uh, you know, at, uh, some of the second derivative of each directions, each coordinate, right? So, you know, d equal usually r, r2 or r3, but, uh, uh, you know, d equal 2 or 3, but, you know, higher dimension, of course, is possible. And then this Laplacian eigenvalue problem is, of course, defined like uh, Laplacian u, negative Laplacian u equal lambda u in that omega, uh, domain omega. And then we want to find both lambda and u, of course, right? Okay? So normally, okay, for this type of Laplace uh, eigenvalue problem, you need to specify so-called boundary conditions. And the boundary condition is, uh, is very important. And usually, uh, three type of boundary conditions are used most often, right? Um, first, Dirichlet boundary condition, which is homogeneous Dirichlet boundary condition, which is this eigenfunction or solution of this Laplace uh, eigenvalue problem at the boundary is completely zero. It's tied, like a, you know, drum skin, right? Okay. And then uh, this is also very common: the Neumann boundary condition. Normal derivative at these two endpoints at uh, at the boundary is zero. Okay. So that also sometimes physical condition that you can basically think, think about, right? Okay. Uh, in, installation of a heat, for example. Um, the Laban boundary condition or imp impedance boundary condition is a little bit more general. Okay, it 
can include both Dirichlet and Neumann depending on this constant A and B. Okay, this is a linear combination of a boundary value and a normal derivative at the boundary. Okay? So those are common boundary conditions. Uh, so I already mentioned why I want to construct some uh, eigenfunctions like this. But let me uh, you know, give you a little bit more, right? So why not analyze and synthesize an object of interest uh, on the irregular domain using genuine basis function tailored to that domain? Okay, instead of basis function developed for rectangles or you know tori or balls, right? Okay, because that that geometry doesn't match. So after all, it, this is very important. Sines and cosines are eigenfunction or Laplacian on a rectangular domain. For example, it, you know in a one D case, if you have a unit interval, right? Okay, uh, zero from zero to one. Okay, a Laplacian eigenvalue problem is minus u double prime equal lambda u. The solution is basically sine and cosine, okay? Sine pi k x, or cosine pi k x. So, um, so then, if you impose Dirichlet boundary condition, the solution becomes sine, okay? In the case of line or rectangle, okay? Neumann case, you, you get cosine, okay? And then you have, uh, you know, if you impose a periodic boundary condition, this becomes a complex exponential, like usual Fourier basis functions, right? And then uh, all these special functions of your favorite special functions appear in mathematical physics, like a spherical harmonics, Bessel functions, and pro spheroidal wave functions, all these are basically the Laplacian eigenfunctions on a specific uh, domain, like a spherical domain, cylindrical domain, and spheroidal domains, respectively. So, um, th and then, uh, of course, Laplacian eigenfunctions allow us to perform spectral analysis of the data measured on that domain. So, um, or even, you know, uh, graphs and networks, uh, that which I'm going to talk about in excursion two. So this you can view, therefore, as a generalization of Fourier analysis. Instead of lines or rectangular domains, so we have a more general domains, like a weird shaped domain, like, a, you know, island of Japan or maybe, uh, you know, um, uh, graphs, networks, okay? So, but, okay, I will emphasize this one. Um, so you have to be very careful, uh, you know, about general, you know, uh, associating the Fourier analysis and the eigenfunction analysis, okay? So, um, in fact, you have a much more complicated phenomenon on a weird domain or graphs, a complicated graph, Okay, if you uh, use uh, Laplacian eigenvectors or eigenfunctions, okay, and in particular interpretation of eigenvalues, uh, uh, you know, very difficult, especially um, you know uh, if you have complicated domains. Okay, in a very simple domain like a line or a rectangular domain, um, a line, one D line, it's no problem. Okay, there's a very basic and uh, fundamental correspondence between. Uh, Fourier analysis and then Laplacian eigenfunction. So as in the case of cycle, like ring, okay, periodic boundary condition. But even in, if you extend this shape into a two-dimensional rectangular domain, looks like a very simple, but yet if you compute it in terms of Laplacian eigenvalues and Laplacian eigenfunctions, we will have some problems. So that's I'm going to talk about in excursion two. All right, so now the problem of uh, Laplacian eigenfunctions in terms of computation especially is the following. So analysis of L is difficult because of its unboundedness because this is a differential operator. Uh, usually uh, it's better to analyze its inverse. Oops. Uh, sorry. You can just uh, push escape on the keyboard. Uh, push escape on the keyboard. Thanks. Uh, the so-called Green's function, okay, which is integral operator, okay. So uh, integral is better than differentiation in terms of st stability, numerical stability, of course, uh, because it's uh, it's compact, self-adjoint, and so uh, L inverse also has a discrete spectrum. So uh, and okay, therefore uh, L has a complete uh, Laplacian itself has a complete orthonormal basis of L2. So in other words, you can do 
eigenfunction expansion of a function in L2, this on, living on this function, or omega. OK, so you can write, uh, if you observe any function or data on this domain, and if you have this uh, Laplacian eigenfunctions, then you can you know, get a linear combination of uh, basis functions to represent that data or function. But the difficulty, of course, is how to compute it. So the difficulty to compute eigenfunctions on a complicated domain Okay, through this uh, L uh, directory, Laplacian uh, e equation, it's called also Helmholtz equation, uh, on a general domain is difficult. Okay, people use a uh, finite element method sometimes of the complicated domain, but it's difficult. And, well, I said that the Green's function where integral operator is better, but uh, in terms of, uh, you know, uh, properties, stability and so forth, but still, uh, constructing a Green's function on a general shape domain, which exactly satisfies those popular boundary conditions, like a Dirichlet Neumann Robin boundary condition, it's still difficult. So here's the uh, idea I basically got some time ago. So in order to avoid these difficulties, okay, let's forget about the precise boundary condition we need to s satisfy, like a Dirichlet uh, you know, Neumann and so forth. Well, let's you know put aside the boundary condition a little bit, and then consider some uh, integral operator which commute with this uh, Laplacian operator. Okay, so it turns out that this commuting integral operator, okay, uh, is you know very useful because if well, you can basically view this uh, o uh, instead of uh, operator, you can view this as uh, matrices. Okay, if two matrices commute. In other words, A, B equal B, A. They share eigenvectors, OK? So, so this is, a, a, I traced the history of this statement. Suppose K and L commute, and one of them has an eigenvalue with finite multiplicity. Then K and L share the same eigenfunction corresponding to that eigenvalue. In other words, L phi equal lambda phi, and K phi equal mu phi. Uh, lambda and mu may be different. Okay? Maybe it's uh, inverse to each other. Uh, that often happens, but the uh, eigenfunction, eigenvectors is the same, okay? So this uh, tra may be traced back to Frobenius long time ago, uh, or uh, at least um, there's a very nice book uh, by Bernard Friedman, uh, which was reproduced, repu republished by um, Doba. Um, uh, so that's a... a uh, applied mathematics textbook, actually. So that, uh, and then this theorem probably very, uh, is uh, very, you know, uh, well known among especially uh, quantum physics community. Okay, so I use this idea and then just replace the usual strict, is, is, yes? Does it go in, in both directions? In other words, if they share, if they share, um, you know, is that an if and only if, or is uh, it? I think it's not necessary if and only if. I think. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So the Green's function. Um, uh, actually, it's not completely clear to me. So you may be able to construct some. Uh, it's not completely clear. So there may be some argument you can make by constructing a linear. Uh, you know, uh, those. Uh, eigenvectors through, you know, singular value decomposition, and then, but it's not, not clear to me right now. Okay, so, uh, so Green's function, instead of considering Green's function with a strict boundary condition, as I mentioned, let's forget about that Green's uh, function, strict Green's function, and then let's consider this instead, so-called fundamental solution Laplacian, which is also called free space Green's function. So this is a nice set of functions. If the domain is D, okay, this is just a negative half of the distance between two points. Okay, in the case of 2D, this is a logarithmic kernel function. Okay, in, the, uh, in D is larger than 2, so this is this form. Okay, for example, in D equals 3 in particular, this is a 1 over 4 pi times the distance between two points. So all these, you know, this uh, uh, fundamental solution, Laplacian, basically, um, okay, uh, depends on the distance between two points, okay, so, um, and it's nice form, okay, 
And then if you um, apply Laplacian, this becomes, uh, because of fundamental solution, this becomes delta function, right? Okay, at y, for example, or x, depending on which one you want to differentiate. Uh, so then, okay, it turns out that if you use this kernel function and define the integral operator, that guy, okay, commute with Laplacian. But, as I said, because I forget about, I, I didn't, didn't explicitly deal with boundary condition, so this one gives you some different boundary condition than those standard ones. So here, so I define this kernel function, like in the case of 2D, it's a logarithmic function times function, okay, input function f, okay, and then f is defined on the omega, and then instead of a whole space, like R2 or R3, Okay, I specify this integral on the domain. Okay, that, that's uh, basically my uh, integral operator. Okay, then what happens is that this k commute with Laplacian. Okay, so that can be proven easily using Green's formula, in fact. Green's, Green's identity. But then the boundary condition okay, of this integral... So if you specify integral operator, okay, the boundary condition is automatically specified okay, by specifying integral operator. Okay? Uh, in the case of a differential equation like Laplacian, you need to specify yourself the boundary condition. So if you specify, uh, if you use Laplacian po portion, and then um, the boundary condition okay, uh, imposed by this uh, integral operator turns out to be this form, but Actually, this is a more precise form. I don't, you don't have to worry about it because in order to solve an uh, integral operator, uh, eigenvalue, operate, eigenvalue problem with k, you don't need to basically know this, uh, integral, uh, this boundary condition. Okay, so it turns out that this is uh, something like a, a single layer, double layer potential type boundary condition. It shows up in many places. Okay, so, and then, also, also uh, another interesting thing I found out is that that eigenfunction is a Laplacian okay, eigenvalue problem right, like inside the domain. But the outside, it's zero. In other words, it's a harmonic function, very smooth. Okay? And then it decays with a certain rate when, uh, when you go outside the domain and go far. And then uh, this fi uh, finally, the, this kernel function can be written as an uh, eigenfunction expansion, so therefore you can write those eigen, uh, not only kernel function, but also data living on the domain using these phi j's. Phi j's. All right, so for example, this is a real challenge, but I had uh, uh, this uh, number of points on this domain is something like uh, uh, 387,924. So the kernel matrix is this size, right? Okay, and uh, using, okay, so this is a large matrix, but the point is, I, I'm not, I don't have enough time today to talk about this, but uh, because this kernel form, okay, you need to discretize this kernel function, but this kernel function in this case 2D is a logarithmic function of 2D distance between two points. That kernel function is called harmonic kernel, and then you can use, for example, fast multiple methods to speed up the computation, okay, to compute matrix vector uh, product. Order n squared, instead of order n squared, you get constant number, uh, order n, okay. Well, um, so you can basically do an iterative algorithm like a Lanchus iteration and so forth to get the eigenvalues and eigenvectors. And then here's the... Uh, uh, top 25 eigen, uh, base, uh, eigenvectors computed using uh, FMM. Um, so you start oscillating main directions first, right? Okay, like this. Okay, and then you start seeing some other uh, oscillations also. So, so the point of this graph, this plot is that, okay, if you have a data living on that complicated domain, you can write the, that data with a linear combination of those guys. Okay, I'm just showing only top, top 20, uh, fast 25 basis functions, right? Okay. All right, so now uh, I'm going to talk about applications in a few minutes. Okay, so Laplacian function, the irregular domain, should be useful for 
interactive, interactive image analysis, as I mentioned, like uh, this face shape or some weird shape domain, and you want to characterize, anal analyze those domains interactively by delineating those regions, and then immediately you can compute the eigenvectors, eigen, eigenvectors of that region, and then you can expand that uh, uh, data in that region as a linear combination of those guys, and then you can see the size of the coefficients, you can do filtering, and all sorts of things, right? So that's what, uh, you know, uh, people should be able to use in medical image analysis and biometry, uh, geophysical data assimilation, right, okay, ocean current data, as, as I said. Um, so, but uh, today, due to the time constraint, I'm going to talk about only one application, so which is uh, this. Okay, statistical image analysis. So comparison with uh, PCA. So uh, we consider a stochastic process uh, living on a domain omega, and then uh, usually uh, Karun and Loeb transform is often used, right? And then Karun, uh, PCA or Karun and Loeb transform implicitly incorporates geometric information of the pixel locations through data correlation or covariance matrix. And then our eigenfunctions use explicit geometric information through harmonic kernel, or this K, X, Y. So here's a, a data set we use. So this is a, log, logs, a, fa a famous data set, log, log, Logs uh, Gallery data set uh, we received from Larry Shirovich at Mount Sinai. Um, he was formerly at uh, Brown University, Applied Math Division. And it contains small uh, number of faces, like 143 faces of Brown uh, University's uh, fa faculty and graduate students. And then I extracted this left and right eye regions, okay, like this. This is just three of them. So the domain we are considering is this shape. So this is the, uh, when I computed PCA, using half of that uh, available data set, like uh, 72 or 73 people, okay, I get this. Right? So this is a uh, uh, mean, so therefore this is just a mean of the, all these 72 images, so it looks like just average, right? Okay, and this is a first mode, second mode, and so forth. But as you can see, PCA case, these are actually linear combination of actual training data set. Okay, so in other words, base vectors are computed from a training data set, okay? So here's a comparison, Laplacian eigenfunctions, first nine of them, okay? So these basis functions have nothing to do with the data set. This is purely from a geometry, okay, shape, okay, of the eye shape, right? So first one is completely dark, means that it's constant. So if you take an inner product of this vector with the data, it gives you the average, of course, right? Okay, so this one, second one, basically is a positive negative. Okay, it just look look like a sine and cosines. Okay, it's like a, you know drums. Okay, two drums. Okay, so it's going like this, right? Okay, so this is a next set. So this is a, again a PCA, a more a higher order, like a okay, linear combination of those uh, actual training data set, and this is a. a uh, Laplacian eigenfunctions. You have more oscillation, you know, characteristic oscillation of various shapes. Mode. Okay, so here what I did is that, okay, I computed the uh, coefficients using both uh, PCA and then uh, Laplacian eigenfunctions, and then this is the energy of the coefficients in the logarithmic scale. So as you can imagine, uh, if you use PCA, Okay, most of the energy is concentrated in the first, uh, you know, principal component. And then second, so first, it's basically decaying quickly, right? Okay, energy is very, com you know, uh, but pushed to this first one. Okay, then if you look at this Laplacian eigenfunction, yeah, of course, the first one also has a high energy, but then also there are a lot of uh, structure in it. For example, eigenfunction uh, number seven, okay, has a high energy mode band throughout, also 13, okay, right? So what are they? So it turns out that phi seven, okay, high energy eigenfunction in that one, basically has this shape. 
So these guys, like, uh, if you take inner product, okay, these are actual eyes. So these are the coefficient, large coefficient eigen, uh, 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 data set uh, with respect to this guy. Okay, and then this one, okay, these two have a small uh, energy uh, along this basis function. So for example, correlation of inner product of this vector and this vector gives you very close to zero because this guy is closing the eye, right? So by doing so, therefore, I can see, I can check who is sleeping, for example, right? So uh, in the audience. So this one is another basis function which basically has high energy band throughout. And then this one basically has a high correlation with these guys. Okay, well this one uh, is actually almost like a, you know, this band and this band matches, and this one doesn't, out of phase. So you can see, for example, asymmetry detection I can do, right? For example, those eyes, basically, uh, left and right eyes are asymmetric more or less, and then this is more symmetric ones. By checking the energy of the uh, eigenvectors, okay, uh, uh, coefficients corresponding to eigenvectors, okay, of Laplacian, because eigenvalue, uh, eigenvector of Laplacian, uh, as I showed you, it has some mode, like a left-right mode, right, okay. Symmetric, uh, asymmet you know, uh, anti-symmetric, and so forth. So I basically computed energy of uh, um, odd uh, eigenvectors, and then I can basically see who's, uh, who is basically has high energy and so forth for so that particular. Can, can you associate some uh, geometrical significance to the uh, the eigenfunction? Yes. And, and the corresponding uh, the corresponding set of eyes. Um, so, um, so I, okay, so the shape information, okay, you, uh, not only eigenvectors, and, but if you look at eigenvalues, also that, you know, in shape information is right. encoded in yeah. that eigenvalues. Uh, for example, especially lower eigenvalues or smaller eigenvalues, because these guys are related to the size of the object or perimeter length of the object and so forth. So here, uh, basically, you know, uh, I need to compute the eigenvectors in order to analyze the data. And then uh, eigenvectors, okay, in this case, okay, start with uh, no oscillation, like a DC component. Mm -hmm. And then you start, you know, one oscillation, okay, second and so forth, okay. And uh, so here, okay, I have uh, two separated domains but with this formulation of integral operators, I, I, I basically can compute the eigenvectors. For, uh, this, you know, eigenvectors is a one, one eigenvector basically supports both sides. Mm -hmm. I can also analyze separately, or left only or right only. That I can do too. Okay, that's uh, you know another aspect of this approach because you can basically tailor the shape. Mm -hmm. Okay, but here, okay, because shape is relatively simple. It's almost like a really sine and cosine in this case, okay? Uh, or uh, two-dimensional drums, in fact, right? Okay. Uh, okay. So summary of the excursion one. So this approach, using commuting integral operators, allows object-oriented image analysis, signal analysis. They get faster decay. I didn't have time to talk about the decay coefficient, coefficient decay properties, but then uh, let's, therefore let's give us effect. Uh, we can naturally extend the basis function outside the initial domain because outside that support is harmonic function, smoothly, uh, smooth decay. Right? Okay. And uh, we can extract the geometric information of a domain as as I mentioned, through eigenvalues a little bit, like, uh, you know, size, area, uh, length, or whether you have a holes and so forth, okay, uh, in the domain. Uh, we can decouple geometry and domain information and statistics of data. That I would like to emphasize because basis vector is completely out of computed from the shape, okay? So therefore, the coefficient, okay, expansion coefficient basically carry all the statistics of the data. Right? Not the basis function, the coefficient. Okay. PC, PCA, or coronal wave transform, it mixes both. 
both eigenvectors and the, both the basis functions and the coefficients depends on the data. So that's the problem, right? Okay. Um, then, as I said, uh, okay, I didn't have time to talk about von Neumann, Klein, oppression, and so forth. Um, I um, I uh, can use uh, FMM method to speed up the computation, uh, but still a lot of uh, uh, remaining things uh, we can you know think about. How about, uh, for example, uh, think about a higher order of, uh, operators and oppression, like uh, by harmonic operators. So here's a, a list of uh, my heroes in this equation one, like uh, starting with Green, Lord Lady, uh, uh, Weil, uh, Herman Weil. Uh, these guys basically are expert on eigenvalue programs, right? On Neumann, uh, and then uh, Lochlin and then Green guard, I basically listed them because I use uh, um, pass multiple method. So any questions so far for this part? So, so if you are interested, this part, okay, so I have uh, uh, lecture notes available, and then I also organize uh, various uh, different uh, workshops throughout years, and then many of the uh, workshop talk slides are available through my website. Uh, and then these two are the main source of the uh, contents of the talk today, okay, uh, of the first part. Any questions so far? So now, excursion two, the graphs. All right, so now, after I received the actual data from a neuroscientist, the dendritic trees of neuron, I got more and more interested in uh, uh, data analysis on the graphs. So that was almost 12 years ago, actually. So I, uh, I think this area, already it's quite important in physical, uh, in signal processing community, like a graph signal processing. Um, but uh, just, you know, uh, I'll give you some motivations, like more and more data uh, available or collected in a distributed and irregular manner, like a sense from sensor networks or social networks or web pages or biological networks. And uh, also, for those data set given on the uh, graphs, it's also important to analyze the topology of the graph, connectivities, right? Okay, and then data measured on nodes. So the Fourier and wavelet analysis and synthesis have been crown jewels for data sampled on regular lattices, right? Like a JPEG 2000 standard is based on bioorthogonal wavelets, right? And then uh, all JPEG depend, uh, you know, uh, use uh, DCT, discrete cosine transform, of course. Right? So those are very important. So why not, uh, you know, lift those tools for unorganized data and irregular sample data set? In fact, irregularly sample data set uh, in a domain I already explained in excursion one. The excursion two, I'm concentrating on the data on the graphs or graphs, itse graphs themselves, right? So, um, yeah, so for example, this is a uh, uh, slice I got from uh, uh, Professor Chang at UC San Diego. She's an expert on spectral graph theory, of course. And then this is a subgraph of Hollywood graph. And then each node corresponds to uh, uh, actors or actress um, in Hollywood. And then uh, if they basically uh, did the movie, so then the link between them, right? Okay, edge between them. So there's a, a some figure here, right? Okay, which uh, uh, which showed up in many movies with all sorts of different people, like uh, Kevin Bacon maybe is around here, right? Okay, and then some other guys, unfortunately, shows up on only one movie and then disappeared. Okay, never showed up. So forth. So this is a, a type of graph. Okay, uh, you know it's interesting graph. And then, of course, if uh, each point measures some data, right? Okay, then you can analyze the data. Okay, if you think about something like a, a eigenfunction, eigenvectors on this graph, for example. 
Uh, this is a more uh, down-to-us data set which I really use myself. So this is the uh, retinal ganglion cells of neurons, um, reti retinal ganglion cells of, of a mouse. And then this is a 3D um, uh, scanning microscope uh, graph. And then this is a plan view. This is a, a you know, side view. Uh, so you have a, a even same mouse and the same uh, retinal ganglion cells. Okay, uh, classified as uh, ganglion cells, they have a different uh, topology. Okay, some of the uh, ganglion cells basically horizontally spread widely. Okay, some of them more you know concentrated vertically, right? Okay, so uh, and then connecting to the different layers, for example, like this guy, the connectivity. Uh, this this one is quite different, right? Okay, and so forth, and then. <sighs> So this is actually the one neuron, uh, dendritic neurons I'm going to talk about later on. So this is a three-dimensional view. And then the, this point basically is a sample. Okay, is it my uh, neuroscience collaborator basically painstakingly you know, uh, segment from a 3D image to construct those traces of neurons. So automatic tracing is still not easy. And still needs uh, people. Uh, this uh, you know requires quite a bit of human intervention. So the reducing the time to segment these neurons, it's very important. But I'm not I'm not doing this. Okay. So if you are interested in image segmentation, automatic tracking of those neurons, there's a lot, you know people will really appreciate it in neuroscience. So and then this is the shape of a dendritic trees. Even in within the mouse, so you have a different classes, like a wide spread guys and more concentrated ones and so forth. So we want uh, we want to analyze or cluster these guys. Okay, so basic definitions and notations for graphs. Okay, so I have a graph like here. Okay, I have n nodes of a graph, whatever the nodes represent. Okay, maybe a sensor locations or a pixel location, whatever. And then uh, these pixels or sensors are related to each other or connected to each other with some weights. Okay? Weights often is a, a affinity or in some information between these two. Right? Similarity or closeness or you know, uh, distance, it depends. Right? So you have to be very careful how to define your weights, in fact. Okay. Then uh, edges basically is the, these guys, uh, uh, E1 to EM, I say. Okay. And then W is a matrix, called weight matrix, and then uh, each basically, uh, okay, WIJ, I uh, row, J sporum, uh, represents the edge weight between the vertices I and J. Okay? All right, so the simplest type of graph is actually uh, unweighted. In other words, it just shows a connectivity. So uh, weight uh, one if these two i and j node, i and j node are directly, con uh, you know, uh, linked. Zero otherwise. So it's a zero one matrix. W is zero one matrix. It just shows a topology, a connectivity of the nodes. Uh, or if you have more, uh, oh, this is a common one, right? So uh, this. Uh, a weighted graph, often people use something like Gaussian weight, that if you have some information at I and information at J, okay, you can measure the distance or closeness between these two nodes, okay, in some sense, like maybe correlation or similarity, right? Okay. And then uh, you express like that way. Okay. The epsilon is some parameter you need to tune. That's often difficult anyways. Okay? So so then, uh, matrices associated with graph, we have a de degree matrix, which is, uh, uh, if you prepare this matrix W, then you basically uh, sum, uh, columnwise, and then get this DI, right? Okay, so that's a, a diagonal ma uh, matrix, degree matrix, okay? And we can also think about something like uh, random walk on that graph, okay, uh, depending on that uh, weight. Higher weights, basically, uh, you know, uh, if you have an edge with a higher ed, uh, weight, then that random walk tends to go there more, you know, uh, 
than a lower weight ones. And then you can do this uh, uh, computation, uh, you can construct a transition matrix, okay, based on the weights and then degree, right, okay, and then uh, W is symmetric because we are dealing with un uh, undirected graph today, okay. Directed graph case, it's not necessarily symmetric, okay. Uh, and then if you, you construct a transition matrix, it's not uh, uh, symmetric, uh, but interesting enough, this transition matrix can be written as a D inverse times W. Okay, so here's uh, uh, matrices, uh, Laplacian matrices, graph Laplacian, okay. So D minus W, okay, which is a usual unnormalized uh, Laplacian matrix defined on the graph, okay, uh, this uh, LRW of G is a random walk normalized version, okay, of a graph, because this is I minus this transition uh, probability matrix, okay. So D minus one. So this is not symmetric. Okay. Uh, L sim is a symmetrized version of this one. Because w is sandwiched by square root of this diagonal matrix, degree matrix D, like this. So like this. Okay. So these three are often used. I mainly concentrate on D, uh, this first one, un uh, und uh, unnormalized uh, pressure. So what this matrix does is actually this is just a finite ap difference approximation of a differential operator, Laplace operator on the graph. I will exactly show you the uh, relationship of this one using a simple graph in, in the next slide. Okay, but just think about this just as a finite difference. Okay, actually if you have a, a linear uh, path graph, this becomes really the finite difference, second order finite difference. Okay, and then this is a, a corresponding one for a random walk version and symmetric version. So why we want to use graph Laplacians? Because again, okay, like a general shape domain excursion one, uh, we can do a lot of things if you compute uh, graph Laplacians. Again, graph Laplacian again by use I reflect uh, some <coughs> geometry or topology uh, of that graph, like connectivity and all sorts of things number of separated components, and then Fan Chang in her uh, famous uh, book, Spectral Graph Theory, she said, this monograph, this book, right, is an intertwined tale of eigenvalues and their use in unlocking a thousand secrets about graphs. So that's what she said, okay. But, okay, um, I'm more concentrating on eigenvectors rather than eigenvalues uh, today. Um, okay. So why eigenfunctions or eigenvectors, right? So again, Laplacian eigenfunctions form an orthogonal basis. And we can expand data or functions defined or measured on the graph. Okay, we can perform spectral analysis. And then also we can use uh, those eigenvectors to cut graph into pieces. Because that's a spectral clustering. Okay, which is related to the famous uh, famous uh, uh, Kuran nodal domain theorem for the regular dom uh, uh, domain RD. Um, so I have to say the eigenvectors are less studied than uh, uh, eigenvalues in the in the in the graphs. Um, so I basically say uh, eigenfunction eigenvectors interchangeably. Okay. And then uh, I will denote a uh, phi, a uh, vector form of phi, as eigenvectors, okay? A node is x. Okay, so here's a very simple but important example. If you have a path graph like this, this is extremely simple. And then uh, you have n nodes, and then weight, edge weight is just one. Yeah, okay. So if you have this uh, tri-diagonal, uh, so in that case, you have a tri-diagonal matrix like L, okay? Then you can see that this degree matrix is this diagonal uh, weight, uh, okay, this is two end, end point is one, all the intermediate ones is two, okay? This is a, a, a connectivity, right, okay? The first one is connected only to the next one, the next one is connected to both sides, like this, okay? And then it turns out that for this data, uh, this graph, Okay, uh, Laplacian eigenvectors are 
actually discrete type, uh, this DCT basis vector, in particular type 2. Nothing but this DCT type 2, which is um, used in, graph, uh, in uh, JPEG. Okay, if you use a symmetric version, this becomes DCT type 1. So in this case, okay, we know explicitly lambda k and phi k. Okay, lambda k is 4 times sine squared, this sine uh, pi k to, uh, to n. So this is simply increasing as k goes larger. And then phi k is just a cosine function. Okay? So no problem. So here, in this case, we have exact correspondence between uh, eigenvalues okay, and then frequency. Okay? But in general, it's not the case. Okay? So let's skip this one because... Okay. So, I, I just would like to, uh, you know, in the end, uh, in the last four minutes, I would like to mention the problem of uh, eigenvalues because many people view eigenvectors of graph Laplacian as a replacement of sine and cosines, which is fine up to some point, but actually it's, uh, it's dangerous because uh, as the frequency, okay, people use uh, eigenvalues as a replacement of frequency in the Fourier analysis on the graph, but the uh, uh, notion of frequency is you define on general graphs, okay, as I, I, will, I, as I will show you. So, um, uh, also, the eigenvectors of graph Laplacian exhibit very peculiar behavior depending on topology and structure of the given graph. So, uh, for example, um, technique like a spectral graph uh, wavelet transform um, depend, which tries to construct a wavelet on the graph uh, use so called little Peyre theory which basically split the frequency uh, information into dyadic intervals and then some, you know, use those corresponding eigenvectors okay, uh, with these uh, dyadic intervals. So um, there's a problem uh, here, okay, unless the underlying graph is very simple, like a path graph or a cycle. So, so here's a 2D, very simple problem, 2D lattice graph. So in the case of two-dimensional graph, okay, let's consider, okay, graph of a, a rectangular domain, regularly sampled, okay, M, M points in horizontal direction, N points in a Y direction, vertical direction. Then eigenvalue is, case eigenvalue is just sum of uh, eigenvalues of x direction or y direction. And then eigenvectors corresponding to the product, tensor product of x direction oscillation, y direction oscillation, or y direction. Okay? But the problem is that, okay, so we get, if we do the eigenvalue analysis, you get uh, lambda 0, lambda 1, lambda 2, phi 0, phi 1, phi 2. Now we don't know kx and ky. We just get eigenvalues, sequence of eigenvalues. We don't know the mapping between k and the kx and the ky. So that's a problem because here we got, okay, so they have, this is an eigenvalue, uh, okay, this is a very small graph, 7 by 3, but it explained very well. So this is, uh, I align them, okay, in terms of increasing eigenvalues. Uh, the, this is uh, eigenvectors. These are eigenvectors. So phi zero constant, DC component. Okay. And then you have oscillations in x direction, as you can see, increasing, right? But phi three, all of a sudden, this oscillation stops. In this it, horizontal direction, it's completely constant. And then there's a one oscillation here. Okay. Then this is an oscillation in uh, y direction, x direction again. And then this stops again, a y direction oscillation stops again, and then start oscillating and so forth. So this, okay, in other words, so oscillation, okay, uh, and the eigenvectors are not, uh, have a very simple relationship. What we really want to do is to organize, uh, this is a usual organization. Instead of this, we really want to organize in two-dimensional manner like this, right? Okay. Okay, this is uh, uh, increasing horizontal frequency. Uh, horizontal frequency. This axis basically is uh, vertical frequency, right? If we can organize the, this guy, okay, into this form, 
then we are in the business because we can do a lot of uh, nice things about this. But the question is how? So I will probably stop with uh, this slide. So the idea okay, we have, <coughs> this is a re very recent technique, a uh, method I uh, basically uh, uh, came up. So how can we quantify the difference between eigenvectors? So that's the question. And the usual uh, L2 distance between two eigenfunctions, eigenvector, doesn't work because they are orthonormal basis. So therefore, the distance in terms of two norm is just square root of two. Okay? All eigenvectors. So therefore, they are equal uh, distance. So what we do is, instead, is the so-called ramified optimal transport. Okay? So we convert this each eigenvectors to uh, some probability distribution okay, on the graph. Like, for example, you can square the amplitude, or magnitude, or coefficients of eigenvectors uh, components. Right? So then sum is 1. So therefore, each one you can view as an eigenvector uh, probability distribution. I have a two probability distribution, let's say PI and PJ. Now how we can basically transfer this probability mass to, from one distribution to the other. That gives you some cost. Okay? Then uh, that cost I can use as a distance between two points, uh, two, two eigenvectors. Okay? And then I can embed that uh, distance matrix using a so-called multidimensional scaling to organize how these eigenvectors are related. So I will show you uh, so after this one, I can organize eigenvectors like this way, which is a rotated version, but uh, it's very similar to what uh, we got, what we wanted to do. So, so neuron data set, okay, I have also, oh, I can organize these eigenvectors defined on a neuron like this shape. Okay, this is a DC component corresponding to DC component vector. And these are localized eigenvectors and so forth. So it's 3D shape okay, of the neurons eigenvector. So this is a dual domain of a frequency, in some sense, dual domain picture of the neurons. Okay, that's it. So, uh, so I just would like to mention my heroes uh, in this succession too. Finally, uh, these are set of uh, uh, references, uh, the latest one, I just put it, uh, uh, uploaded on the archive. Um, there are a lot of things to do still, uh, but natural eigenvectors of Laplacian it is use, should be useful for all, all sorts of data analysis. And I would like to basically thank uh, my four mentors who have been very uh, source of my inspiration for a long time. Thank you very much. Any questions? Yes. Uh, in many uh, image problems or conservation problems, uh, uh, we realize that it can be beneficial to embed the data into a graph so that we can uh, make use of the results that you have to, yes. to visualize the right. properties. Uh, but the step before that is if we do not do it manually, like the neuroscientist, but uh, if we do want to do automatic mesh. Previously, in the rectangular grid, we have this motion estimation are using optical flow, mm -hmm. basing on the gradient uh -huh. to, to do the match. Mm -hmm. But it seems that uh, it's not immediately clear to me that uh, how we can uh, put those uh, data onto the graph directly. Yeah. So, so a graph construction itself, I didn't talk about it. And then there are a, a lot of work. How to, for example, if you have a graph in the beginning, and then you measure the data on the graph nodes, then that's fine. Graph is given right, to you. Right. But often what people want to do is to construct the graph itself from the data. Yes. And then there are a lot of work, how to construct a graph from a given data, which is nothing to do with graph. But then you need to think about, for example, what information you want to encode, encode between the data. So for example, if you have a, a vector to measurement, whether you want to associate these two vectors by linking an edge between them, you, need, you have to have some judgment, right? So, um, 
some some people compute some weights affinity uh, between these two gra two points, and then some people use, for example, uh, association with uh, one vector to all the other vectors. That basically gives you a complete graph. One node co co connects to all the other points, all the other nodes with some weight, right? Okay, then you need to construct some, you know, some other people use k-nearest neighbors, okay, in order to construct this graph, all, uh, all sorts of things. And then that's uh, a lot of people, like, uh, for example, uh, um, uh, Spielman um, uh, at Yale also, you know, consider this kind of uh, um, construction, graph construction from the data. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks. Yes. Just following up uh, on your second topic, uh, so I just wonder if you found this those uh, uh, eigen eigen functions, eigen yeah. vectors after the uh, reordering according to the plan you proposed. Yes. What uh, can you say about the geometry of the of the network data? For example, the boundary information, any, any uh, geometry insight can, you can tell about this data. Uh, the organization of basically graph eigenvectors, graph Laplacian eigenvectors I had in mind was that basically if you, you know, move, uh, if you basically connect or, you know, associate some eigenvectors, okay, which share some use, you know, useful information, then that group of eigenvectors can be used to process something. So, for example, uh, I showed you a neural network, uh, a neural net, uh, you know, dendritic trees case, the distribution of points. Okay, I didn't have time to talk about it, but one of the basically points, okay, uh, uh, eigenvectors corresponding to some of the legs of this 3D shape, all correspond to the activities on one particular branch. Okay, so one particular branch of that uh, dendritic tree eigenvectors are oscillating. In all the other locations, that those eigenvectors are quiet, okay? So those are located in the same regions here, okay, in that the dual picture. So I can use those, organizing those guys to construct, you know, something like a wavelet and so forth on that uh, particular branch. And also, uh, some regions I basically showed you, some of the nodes in the uh, uh, bottom of that uh, um, um, croissant shape corresponds to something like a wavelet type eigenfunctions, eigenvectors, which are concentrating okay, around uh, uh, bifurcated nodes. Okay, if you have a nodes with uh, many connections, then eigenfunctions tend to concentrate on that node. Okay, and they look like a wavelet, actually, instead of Fourier. So it's interesting because the first, okay, low frequency, low, fre uh, low eigenvalue mode Okay, low eigenvalue, uh, uh, eigenvectors corresponding to low eigenvalues are global in the beginning. The so DC component all over the place in the, uh, you know, neurons. And then it starts oscillating slowly. Okay, and then when, uh, you know, in, uh, 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 after some, you know, oscillations, they, uh, it start localization. One of the branches basically start oscillating, but the other guys are basically quiet. And then, it, then, you know, each basically, you know, um, branch oscillates, and then toward the end of that uh, spectrum, the eigenvectors correspond, you know, localize <coughs> on those junctions. So that's a phenomenon we discovered, and then there's a reasoning for it. Okay, there's a paper corresponding to that, if you are interested. Okay, well, in the interest of time, we should uh, put uh, an end to the questions. Of, of course, the uh, speaker is here, so you're welcome to uh, to uh, be set an appointment or whatever. And uh, with that, let's uh, thank our speaker. Thank you.